guidelines for building a realistic algorithmic trading market simulator for backtesting while incorporating market impact is the topic of today's uh, presentation. I had a conversation uh, not so recently with the head of the EECS department at uh, MIT, and uh, she shared uh, some of her thoughts about the differences between uh, machine learning, <laughs> computers, robots in general, and uh, humans, and she thought that there wasn't a significant difference between uh, humans and, uh, and robots. So I thought this, uh, you know, this uh, thought to be quite uh, amusing, but um, you know, after thinking about it a bit more, um, I realized that it would be actually interesting to uh, come up with an example in which uh, humans and robots are equally, uh, equally pathetic at something. Uh, so <laughs> for this in mind, uh, so uh, you, you guys have all seen these in any introduction, the, uh, uh, I would say classes in machine learning. So you have a model that is represented by these blue dots. And then you have uh, three different models. The one on the left hand side here represents a underfitted model. The one in the middle, uh, a model that is assumed to be just right. And here you have an overfitted model. And uh, the idea here is, uh, do we as humans, are, are we subject to something similar? So this is a cool example. Uh, so if you have seen in that image, uh, a face here at the bottom, uh, so the, the the sunset with some clouds around, uh, and then or this face at the top uh, uh, top left hand side with three birds uh, flying about, then you're victim of uh, apophenia. Apophenia is like um, I would say a sophisticated word to mean uh, overfitting for uh, humans. And uh, so the question is that uh, why uh, something like this happens to us as humans? Uh, well, the, the answer to this is that the cost of seeing a true pattern far outweighs the, uh, the, the cost of being mistaken with respect to a wrong pattern. Uh, so it's like, uh, you know, to, to make it a little bit more intuitive, in our biological past, uh, it was critical at some point for us to be able to decipher a friendly face to, um, to a foe uh, very quickly. And this is why we have this tendency to be to see faces very quickly. And if you're interested in how this kind of uh, overfitting situations for humans occur in finance, especially in the areas of backtesting, statistics of order, traders' compensation methodology, uh, sales and structured products, or technical analysis, I invite you to go read issue 60 of Wilmot Magazine, uh, page 28 to 37. The title of the article is The Unfortunate Cost of Pattern Recognition, uh, the Genetic Disorder of the Financial Industry. We're going to start, so this is the overall agenda of um, uh, today's uh, discussion. We're going to start with two simple definitions. Uh, so if you take a look at uh, quantity finance, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, during the 20th century, it was dominated by the top-down approach. And this is ever since uh, um, Louis Bachelier's uh, PhD thesis on the theory of speculation. The idea is that uh, we would admit that the stock market is extremely random, but we create some form of, um, I would say, alternative world in which uh, we can harvest this uh, randomness uh, uh, in a business setting and have something coherent that is produced out of this. And this is the whole idea of risk-neutral pricing, options pricing that has dominated uh, 20th century. Uh, now, uh, what is the bottom-up approach? Uh, so the bottom-up approach is kind of taking things uh, at another angle. Uh, and saying that, no, uh, what's going to happen is essentially the opposite. It's the interaction of quantitative strategies together that can yield something that, that appears to be stochastic. And perhaps we can build models or build uh, businesses around this idea rather than the opposite. Uh, so um, really, the, the, the question is that um, quantitative finance has more or less failed for the last 100 years. Uh, can we solve the market with this angle? So um, note here that I've put uh, solve in quotation marks, uh, and I'm going to explain what uh, that means exactly. 
So what we are aiming at, uh, we are aiming at um, looking at the market. So these are supposed to represent fluctuations of a specific underlier, uh, let's say the price of Microsoft or uh, Apple computers. And we want to be able to say, well, this specific fluctuation is the result of a specific ecosystem of strategies interacting with each other. And we want to be able to say that uh, strategy A involves these specific rules in terms of systematic trading. The PNL it has been able to produce as a result of uh, this ecosystem is X, and we are able to say something about the future as well. So, uh, so, so is this idea mad? Is it ambitious? Is it a bit of both? Uh, well, if you take a look at the scientific method, uh, it's always the same thing. Uh, somebody comes up with a hypothesis, uh, simulations are there in order to um, to verify that hypothesis, and as a result of this, uh, people have ironed out their views of uh, of a specific uh, theory, and then through time and through generation, we come up to, with something that is, uh, I would say, interesting. So, uh, perhaps it would be useful to bring a little bit of context in terms of uh, why we're, we want to do that kind of stuff. Uh, we are more or less celebrating the 20th anniversary of the subprime crisis. Uh, you know, that specific crisis uh, created a great deal of malaise in uh, in the financial industry. Uh, all sorts of academic scheme, um, you know, uh, were, um, were sort of born as a result of this. Um, socially responsible finance being one, ESG being another one. And we went to, from a world where uh, models assume data to a world in which the data reassumed uh, the models. And of course, uh, this uh, also um, uh, goes with the rise of machine learning, generative AI, and the rise of uh, big data in general. Perhaps it would be interesting to discuss what is big data. Uh, so pe people have a tendency to understand big data by title only. Uh, big data, also, of course, means more data, but it also means looking at this new data with a completely new angle. And the term datafication was coined several times uh, in the in the past, um, you know, ten years to really insist on this new angle, but it hasn't quite picked up as much as uh, big data. And uh, finally, we are uh, we have been experiencing multiple flash crashes in the last uh, you know fifteen years. This is an example of a flash crash that has occurred on the nat gas uh, market. And what we can observe here is this very um, bizarre sequence of oscillations, which uh, really just uh, what is behind these oscillations are robots uh, trading each other rather than humans, you know, uh, trading each other. So uh, I thought uh, so the, the point of view is quite uh, I would say new, and I thought in order to make it intuitive for the people who are um, uh, in quantitative finance, it would be useful to take a look at uh, what the scientific method for uh, closely related I would say ideas have been deployed in order to um, keep that intuition high for quant finance. So one thing I wanted to discuss is uh, evolutionary dynamics. Uh, so. Evolutionary dynamics is an you know is a, is a subfield of the mathematical sciences or biological sciences depending on uh, you know your background, and uh, it tries to understand um, evolution and more specifically uh, you know why we do certain things and why we we behave in a certain way, and Hamilton who is uh, sometimes uh, known as one of the uh, evolutionary biologists of the 20th century, or even since Darwin, was very interested in the idea of um, uh, how morality can uh, come about uh, in a systematic way as a rule-based approach, rather than assuming that religions are behind why we are the way we are. So in order to study this specific uh, uh, phenomenon or specific idea, he ended the iterative uh, prisoner's dilemma. So in order to understand the uh, iterative uh, prisoner's dilemma, it would be perhaps good to remind what the prisoner's dilemma is. So we have two agents, A and B, who uh, want to decide whether to cooperate or to deceit each other. And depending on whether one cooperates and the other one cooperates or deceits, there is a specific payoff that uh, comes out out of this uh, interaction. 
The reason why it's called a dilemma is that if you are to uh, interact with someone for only one time, there's an incentive in deceiting that person. And uh, this specific idea really bothered uh, uh, many of the evolutionary bio biologists in the 70s. And they came up with uh, what is well known as the Axel Road computer tournament in which different strategies are meant to um, face each other. And the result of this um, specific tournament is to really rank order the best strategies and say something interesting about that tournament. Uh, what was interesting about that specific tournament is a relatively, uh, I would say, simple st strategy emerged out of all of these interactions. And this specific strategy is known as the tit for tat. What is very peculiar with the tit for tat is that it's a good strategy in a sense that it's a moral strategy. It always tries to cooperate when it faces an opponent for the first time, but then uh, has this peculiarity of always replicating what the opponent has done the previous time. What that means is essentially that if uh, that the tit for tat has faced uh, a strategy that always deceit each other, the next time it faces this strategy, it deceits it. But if that specific strategy decides to cooperate again, it has this ability to forgive. And this idea really resonated quite uh, significantly in the uh, in the world of uh, evolutionary dynamics and people like Martin Novak uh, from uh, from Harvard kind of um, uh, developed that idea in the in the two th up to the 2000s where he discussed um, the uh, I would say the formalization of these strategies in terms of weight and for example here you have a strategy of always deceiting here you have a strategy of always cooperating here you have the tit for tat which is the the winner of that specific tournament i talked about and this is the generous tit for tat which is uh, another strategy that uh, martin novak made uh, popular but what is interesting about this is that the formalization of these strategies can be done with numbers and you could decide to make these uh, weights that represents these strategies random at first and and see what happens when random strategies interact with each other and see what happens essentially. So in order to keep the intuition high, I included this specific um, uh, graph that um, is meant to represent the invasion of strategies with respect to ecosystems. So for example, if you have, a, a let's say, um, an ecosystem composed of always cooperators, so the strategy is very simple, always cooperate, it invites the invasion of um, uh, strategies that always deceit, which in turn invites the invasion of tit for tat strategies and other strategies that I could dwell a little bit more into. But what is important, the lesson to uh, incorporate here is that if you have a complex ecosystem, whether it's uh, finance or whether it's like robots that are meant to, um, to represent some sort of geopolitical uh, idea, uh, the frequency of specific strategies in that ecosystem can change the view people have of that ecosystem and the ecosystem can evolve and invite uh, specific strategies to join in because of uh, because they're set up to be vulnerable to specifically uh, certain ideas okay uh, so you'll, you'll understand a little bit better this once I uh, give an example on how to bring about all these uh, um, ideas into quantity finance. Uh, so the other, okay, the other yeah, knocking at the of quantity finance, but hasn't quite uh, been able to open the door just yet, are predator prey models. And uh, so here's a, another example. I, I'm giving all, all of these examples because Every time innovation came in quantitative finance, it came about with uh, within the STEM fields, whether it's from physics, uh, you know, probability theory, uh, computer science, it always uh, comes from outside. And so, for example, this is another example of, um, I, would, I would say, material with potential. And um, typically what people are trying to do in mathematical biology is to uh, understand the health of specific ecosystems of um, species uh, through time based on the population composing that ecosystem. So to give you an example here, so we have a blue line, a red line, and a lighter uh, black line here that represents um, a, a, a set of small fishes for X, uh, let's say sardines, 
Uh, the red line represents, let's say, an intermediate level fish, the tuna, and the black line here represents like, a, I would say, a, a, an alpha predator, uh, which eats the, the intermediate level fish. So the shark eats the tuna and the tuna eats the sardine. And what you have here is, uh, as uh, the thicker black line, is the summation of these three plots. Uh, so you could think about these oscillations as the health of an ecosystem composed of specific strategies, which health is based on the other uh, strategies involved or the other species involved in this. And the motivation behind uh, trying to think about, um, I would say, finance this way is that there's interior in mathematical biology when it comes to studying the stability of the financial markets, uh, which, again, this is really at the frontier between theory and, and practice. Uh, this is just a, another interesting thing I thought uh, I would raise before uh, talking about um, the paper. So now, how can we bring about all this amazing material uh, that we've seen in evolutionary dynamics within quant finance is what I'm going to answer next. Uh, so, you know, when you work in um, quantity finance, you are familiar with the order book. So the order book is uh, really essentially represents uh, the market for the sake of making things very simple. So we have the best bid uh, and the best ask here. And then every volume beyond the fourth best bid and the fourth best ask price is reassigned to the fourth best bid uh, just for the sake of uh, keeping track of something that is not too big. And now we need a communication tool between um, between different strategies. So what we are trying to do here is to uh, uh, define a DNA of a robot that would be able to uh, understand what an order book is and take actions on that order book. Okay, And the way we have uh, decided to uh, define this specific um, problem is through the high-frequency financial funnel, which is a shallow neural network composed of uh, uh, nine uh, um, uh, input layers, one hidden layer, and one uh, output layer. And the colors here have been chosen intuitively, intuitively to represent the connections to the order book. Okay, so goes to delta A1, the fourth best ask goes to uh, to here, and the combination of that information with respect to the weight here gives some sort of action on the same order book. Okay, now you may ask, okay, those we, we have this fancy uh, shallow learning um, uh, DNA, uh, how does this, uh, how is this capable of uh, representing most of the classic financial strategies? Uh, so here we have represented, um, uh, I would say, classic financial strategies in high-frequency financial fo funnel format. So every weight uh, which uh, which is equal to zero has been suppressed here in the high-frequency financial funnel in order to uh, to make it less busy. Okay. So for example, here this is the high-frequency financial funnel, which is um, represents a trend-following strategy. This, is, this one represents a mean reversing strategy. This one represents a multilinear regression. Uh, this one represents an XOR strategy, which is quite uh, important in high frequency trading. And then you can do uh, many other things. You can even do things like uh, uh, regularization and, uh, and so on and so forth. And what we're trying to do is to try to see whether uh, if you were to uh, throw all these strategies together in that ecosystem and you would let them interact with each other, which one would prevail? Uh, so that's what we're trying to, to understand with the idea, with the intuition that more complex means more dominant. Uh, we, we saw that this, was, uh, this wasn't actually the case, but uh, for the sake of keeping things intuitive, uh, I thought it would be great to uh, present the information this way. Uh, so how, how we... Uh, so what's the idea? The idea is really what I said. So is to use a genetic algorithm, uh, and, um, and so the genetic algorithms are are a set of uh, I would say machine learning techniques that are not um, often discussed because they're not uh, you know very I would say uh, optimal. However, they're very good in terms of uh, intuition, and they're great in terms of studying the dynamics of ecosystems. So. 
typically, a genetic algorithm has a fitting function. So the fitting function on our side is the profit and loss of these strategies interacting through an order book. And what we do is that all the strategies which PNL is below zero after a certain amount of interactions, they die. And all the others, so the ones with positive PNLs, they're split in half. Half of them uh, um, just survive, and the other half survive and reproduce with a small mutation. And the idea again is to see whether which ones die in and in what circumstances. And can we uh, can we say something interesting about market and more specifically uh, map out some of the ideas that we had in evolutionary dynamics with uh, with finance? So, for example, can we think about like uh, uh, you know uh, let's say random strategies inviting uh, the the invasion of trend followers, which would then invite uh, multilinear regressions because they're able to see additional stuff, and then uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, so in order to really um, build that specific uh, uh, model in a, in a rigorous way, we created uh, the path of interaction. So the path of interaction is essentially a way to document the interaction between different strategies. So to uh, I would say to make things very simple here, the example that we have is um, uh, I think. Uh, frozen here. I don't know whether uh, my camera is frozen, but uh, essentially what we're seeing here is two uh, trend following strategies uh, interacting with each other. And uh, what's going on is that um, uh, if you have a positive seed, then what happens is that that positive seed uh, triggers uh, a buy signal for the first trend following uh, strategy, which then impacts the order book. And that order book is then read by the second trend following strategies. And you can see the price movement go from 100 to 102 to 104 when you have this back and forth in terms of interaction. And what you can do is to record the PNL of each of these strategies, uh, as well as the price uh, change in the markets. So the, 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 the aim of the path of interaction is really to be able to, uh, to document these infinitesimal interactions between uh, strategies. Okay. Uh, so now, how do we track the market? Uh, so that question is answered by uh, sequential Monte Carlo methods. Uh, so sequential Monte Carlo methods are, aren't very well known in the world of uh, quantity finance, but they're very well known in the areas of uh, signal processing. They're often uh, more naturally used for military purposes. So let's say, for example, you're trying to track the position of a specific plane or a specific, um, I would say, rocket across uh, mountains, you only know the, the distance between that rocket and, let's say, the floor. And you know that there are uh, valleys, there's water, there are mountains, and you know that the, the, you know, the height of these mountains. So you can infer the position of the plane by just recording the, the signal that is sent from the rocket to, to your uh, signal processing engine. And this, this is what these dots, these yellow dots are trying to do. And X here is meant to be that position. Uh, however, uh, what has happened in the last uh, 15 years is that people have started using these multi-target tracking algorithms for scenario analysis. So in order to track complex nonlinear, uh, I would say, scenarios, uh, whether in chemistry, whether in um, whether in finance, each of these dots now represent a specific ecosystem, uh, so or a specific um, I would say abstract idea. Uh, so in our case, each of these dots represents uh, uh, an ecosystem composed of specific strategies with a specific rules and with a specific path of interaction. Okay, uh, so now the the when we go back to that very first slide that we had, uh, each of these paths now are uh, easily recorded in terms of uh, the, the path of interaction because we know uh, how uh, which kind of strategies can yield a specific path. As you can see, when you are starting your iterations, there's a lot of ambiguity between which uh, ecosystem we could be talking about. But as your number of iteration increases, then uh, you know more and more about the ecosystem of study, and you're able to say something interesting about uh, the different scenarios. Uh, so, so really, uh, yeah. So, 
What we've done essentially with the, our sequential method, Monte Carlo methods is to track 15 different scenarios and we've been able to uh, show after high certainty uh, which scenarios or which ecosystem we're talking about by just looking at the prices. Okay, so this is really the core idea of, uh, of uh, the paper. Uh, so in terms of summary, I'm going to just uh, talk briefly about uh, what we discussed. So we talked about uh, flash crashes and the connection between patterns uh, oscillations. Uh, we talked about the top-down approach versus the bottom-up approach. Uh, we discussed uh, the high-frequency financial funnel and its connection with the classic financial strategies. Uh, we discussed uh, evolutionary dynamics and the power of uh, some of that mathematical biology when it comes to helping uh, 20, 21st century quantity finance. And we discussed the path of interaction in the context of the high frequency trading uh, ecosystem game. And finally, we uh, looked at uh, tra tracking methods with uh, multi-target tracking. Uh, I have one more slide on, um, on future work, but I thought I would instead uh, allow uh, some questions or answer a few questions instead. Let's see. There's one open. Uh, what was the most profitable strategy in the order book? Yeah. So uh, that's a good question. So the answer to this is it depends on the ecosystem and the other strategies. So one uh, one strategy that um, was actually quite interesting and is a, is a good, um, I would say, uh, support to what is being read in the literature. So momentum strategies, like trend following strategies, uh, seem to be the ones that keep coming back. And uh, this is, uh, you know, quite interesting. We didn't expect that uh, answer uh, to um, to come about. The trend following strategy is like the tit for tat strategy in um, in the um, in uh, I would say the Axel Road computer tournament. Uh, and um, yeah, we we found this very interesting. Uh, it's a very good question. But uh, again, it depends on um, the ecosystem that we are talking about. Okay, so uh, second question, how does uh, market makers work? So yeah, so this is uh, another um, good question. So one uh, limitation of the work would be to add more market makers. So uh, as you're well aware of, uh, the typical strategies of market makers is to put uh, bid uh, like positions both on the bid and the ask, and the profit is typically the, the bid ask spread times the volume. This is the expected uh, I would say PNL of uh, such strategy, with of course some connection with uh, volatility. Uh, so essentially, uh, understanding uh, that a, a big move follows another big move can allow you to uh, change the bid ask uh, around the you know the the strategy. So if anyone is interested, uh, that would be a very good addition to to that um, uh, to that research. Professor Cartea from Oxford uh, actually mentioned that himself, so that was a good question. Uh, uh, next question, thanks. What is the XOR strategy you mentioned in the order book game? Yes, uh, so that's a good question as well. So the XOR uh, strategy is essentially uh, a, um, a, a strategy in which the uh, open interest and the price dynamic are connected in an XOR way. So if you take a look at the XOR function, the XOR function is the output is one zero zero one, uh, and uh, and the way to see it in um, when it compared to let's say a multilinear regression, a multilinear regression has typically the tendency to separate the plane in one and two areas. The XOR strategy separates it in three. So you have one area here, one area in the middle, and a third one here. And, uh, and uh, you know, one of the reasons why uh, people have been interested in uh, deep learning uh, for high frequency trading for many years is because they realized that uh, the XOR strategy was not able to be modeled with multilinear regressions, uh, hence the, the, the motivation around the deep learning. Um, okay. Any recommended resources? Uh, so uh, there are great books uh, around high frequency trading. Uh, Professor Cartea that I mentioned has, um, 
you know, great, uh, a great book uh, on that uh, specific topic. There is um, um, a paper by Ramakant uh, called, um, I believe, uh, Universal Features of Price Formation, a Deep Learning Perspective, which is a great uh, place to start as well. Thank you. <laughs>